Good afternoon from India. Good evening to my friends in Far East. And of course, good morning to people in North America and Canada. It's such a pleasure to welcome all of you to the second day of this global virtual conference on reimagining and transforming the future of law school. We are in the 15th thematic session of the conference, which is entitled Shifting Focuses in Legal Research During the Pandemic. We have a very distinguished set of legal education leaders, transformative individuals and researchers who have played their very important part in institution building efforts during this time. We have with us Professor Dr. Susan L. Karmanian, the Dean of the College of Law uh, at Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar. Uh, Professor Dr. Bertil Emra Order, Dean and UNESCO Chair on Gender Equality and Sustainable Development at the Faculty of Law, Khosh University in Turkey. Uh, my very dear friend, Professor Tan Sheng Han, Dean of the School of Law of the City University of Hong Kong in Hong Kong. Uh, my own colleague here, Professor Kagesh Gautam, Associate Professor at Jindal Global Law School at OP Jindal Global University. And the session will be moderated by another colleague of mine, Professor Dr. Vishwas Devaya, Vice Dean of Jindal Global Law School at JGU. With those words, I would like to now hand this over to Vishwas and I will join in a little later. Thank you. Thank you, Raj, and thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, getting on to the theme of the, the, the session itself, which is largely looking at shifting focuses in legal research during the pandemic. Uh, all of us do understand that the pandemic has pretty much kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, pretty much kind of uh, created, a, you know, uh, things go, you know, created a havoc wherein it is pretty much kind of forced people to get into research areas which they probably have not thought of in the, in the past. And of course, uh, a lot of the pandemic research, especially in the science is actually going into trying to understand the virus, the way it works, trying to actually uh, come up with a, a, a vaccine that can actually deal with, with, with the coronavirus. Whereas a lot of social science and legal research is now focusing on what kind of impact the the, 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 the pandemic has had in terms of uh, you know, uh, society and life and more specifically within the realm of law, various aspects of law, uh, including stuff like contract law, corporate law, uh, uh, evidence law to, to, a, to an extent, criminal law, and, and, and areas like bioethics and health law have largely kind of started focusing on the pandemic itself and the kind of impact it has had in terms of how uh, law and legal research tends to operate. So this actually brings in a whole range of questions that one really needs to address. And I have pretty much kind of flagged four specific concerns out here. More specifically, are we kind of making a shift in terms of our research where we are largely focusing on various aspects of law and society, bringing in the element of the pandemic and the COVID scenario uh, at play. Uh, has it resulted in certain changes in the approaches as far as researchers are concerned? Has it kind of, uh, you know, pushed legal researchers more specifically to kind of get into multidisciplinary research? Uh, has it had an impact in terms of um, how funding has actually gone about? How, how has research funding and grants changed during the pandemic time? Has there been a, a shift, a paradigm shift in terms of uh, the funders actually kind of preferring research that is largely related to the pandemic? Uh, regardless of the fact that it is within the field of law itself and many areas of law itself. And of course, and the other important element of which is part of research is uh, dissemination. How has dissemination gone about uh, when, when the pandemic hit us? Has uh, the last nine to 10 months pretty much kind of resulted in publishers actually going and clamoring for more publications related to COVID related aspects? Has this kind of made things easier or difficult for legal researchers? How law journals, law reviews kind of reacting to this kind of clamoring for articles and publications, which is largely focusing on the pandemic. 
And uh, lastly, of course, a very important element in research that we all need to keep in mind is, of course, the students. We have uh, students researching at various levels, but uh, at, at, at uh, level of doing their dissertation, at the level of doing their doctoral theses. How is this kind of impacted, uh, you know, their research? And what can law schools actually do to kind of enable them to pursue their research? And uh, that's largely the, the four segments that we will be dealing with. And um, I'd kind of, uh, you know, shoot off my first question, uh, which is largely has, has, the, has the pandemic resulted in a lot of legal researchers focusing on pandemic related issues, uh, even, a, even, even within the realm of law, as, as, a lot, as a lot of research kind of started now focusing on COVID and its impact on various aspects of law. If so, what are the motivations? Uh, what is the guiding force for researchers to kind of actually move or make the shift? What kind of adjustments do researchers have to make? And the second aspect of it is, has it really forced, especially legal researchers, those scholars in law, to kind of look at it from a multidisciplinary approach? Uh, and, 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 and to what extent has law schools have law schools kind of accommodated and encouraged multidisciplinary research during the pandemic time? Uh, over to Professor Cheng Han. All right. Well, th thank you very much, uh, Professor Vishwas. You've actually raised a number of, uh, of issues. I'll try to deal with them as uh, concisely as I possibly can. Um, I, you know, I would say that you know, there's, of course, been um, more focus on pandemic related issues because that, as you say, is the issue of the moment. But I have to say that, you know, for many of my colleagues and many of the other people I collaborate with, they continue to work in the areas that they specialize in uh, without necessarily any reference uh, to the pandemic. So in many ways, life still goes on as it has in the past, right? But what I've certainly seen a lot more of uh, people working in the fields of public health regulation um, in uh, constitutional law and public law, certainly turning their attention uh, to pandemic-related issues because that's had a greater impact directly on the fields that they work in, um, you know, particularly the extent to which there might be infringements even of civil uh, liberties. Um, so I think that's certainly uh, very relevant uh, to them. But I think for the most part, um, uh, people have continued to do uh, their work. Um, I've also seen, of course, some publishers being more interested in this area. I recently contributed a chapter uh, to a collection of essays by Oxford University Press. But again, I think that this is to be expected. There are always topical issues that emerge from time to time. There's interest in that. But ultimately, the law is about you know, general principles and general approaches. And I think um, it doesn't stop research going on in many other areas as well. Um, Certainly, the interdisciplinary part of it is quite important. Um, we are certainly trying to push that, but more uh, as a general approach, because I just think that interdisciplinary research is good for law academics as well. Um, it broadens our perspectives. It makes, the, it makes our ideas more informed and more grounded uh, in reality as well. And it opens up um, new insights into the law that we might not otherwise uh, have been alive to. And so, so, for instance, one of my colleagues has put in a COVID-19 interdisciplinary research project, looking at it, obviously, not just from the perspective of law, but from the perspective of business and social sciences as well. And I think that these three areas really do have a convergence here because the economic impact of COVID-19 is immense, both at present as well as its anticipated future uh, impact, uh, effects as well. And certainly on the social side of things, my goodness, the social impact it has on people and how they're going to cope with this, both now and in the future, is also great. And what kind of legal framework might we then have to try to manage this as efficiently as possible? These are big, big ticket issues. And I think COVID-19 has certainly uh, given us uh, more scope to find real areas of interdisciplinarity where things do fit in and, and, and work quite nicely together. So maybe with these comments, I'll pause here and let my other colleagues uh, jump in. Thank you. 
Professor Kugesh. Thank you, Vishwas. Um, uh, I, I think I agree with the uh, suggestions, uh, the remarks that were made by uh, the first speaker. Um, I think if I was to put it in my words, I would say that a shift of focus is necessary in, in times like these. But uh, you must know very carefully uh, what you are shifting uh, and why. Now, I, would, I think I would agree that attention has certainly been shifted, but uh, the deeper concerns, uh, they continue to be the same. I can give you uh, a little bit of an example from my personal experience. Um, since the beginning of the of the pandemic, since the beginning of this year, when the concept, when there was no uh, uh, no nobody could see, for example, in December of last year or or January that there would be uh, a lockdown so soon. It was not something on the horizon. The the concerns that were there, uh, at least in my particular case, in the research, they continued to be the same. One of those concerns, for example, was a delay in courts, about which I've written briefly with Vice Chancellor uh, Rajkumar as well and myself. So that is something that we have always been uh, uh, paying attention to in the law school. Uh, my colleagues before have done it and this tradition will continue. But one of the things that suddenly came to my attention was the fact that there are a lot of uh, cases in the criminal justice system that we don't actually have to prosecute. There is no reason for that. And taking that approach, for example, there are a lot of check bounds, 138 cases. Now people in Delhi have started saying that this is essentially a civil uh, uh, problem. There is no need to have a criminal case. <clears throat> and there are issues like that, which keep, uh, keep on going on. But working with a team of dedicated students, and we did all this online, about which we can speak perhaps later. But uh, we were able to identify that uh, if, uh, for, ex for instance, cannabis is legalized in India, suddenly a lot of pending cases will, will disappear from the courts. There would be no need to prosecute these cases, no need to investigate these cases. Proportionately, that much uh, resources, those, the, that much money, public money is also av available to be spent for other endeavors. So we worked on that and slowly, slowly some recommendations followed. And um, uh, the, the, the concern therefore remained the same. But the pulls and pressures of the of the pandemic that eventually we all have to deal with, they certainly brought other possible solutions to our attention, solutions that perhaps might have escaped attention if uh, there was no pandemic. That's what I had to share. Thank you, Professor Susan. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, it's an honor to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, Raj for the kind invitation. Um, the I think what the pandemic has done it, and, and this is picking a bit on uh, uh, Dean Cheng Han's theme, is that it's caused each faculty member to look at their subject in a different light. Uh, not to wholesale say, I'm shutting down my work in, in constitutional law and I'm gonna focus only on X and Y. And that, and, and that obviously is a predictable response. Yet I, I would like to pick up on, on, on a theme that I think uh, Vishwash, you touched in, in your introductory remarks. And that is, is that if we consider human rights uh, from a pers uh, the perspective of the right to health, then I think we're going to start focusing more on some of the profound changes that could 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 you know develop as a result of the pan pandemic, since we've seen a rights-based society develop since World War II. We have uh, constitutions that talk about rights. We have, of course, the the treaties and the like. Um, this has had a strong focus on the individual and uh, claims individuals may have against the state and freedom of expression the ability to, to, to gather. Of course, there are going to be, uh, there's always a conversation of, of, of religious freedom, the ability to gather and limits that are put on that and, 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 and the like. Uh, but I think that with the, the pandemic, what we're, we're seeing is the need to re-examine the role of, of, of the state in this process. Um, and, um, invariably under certain constitutions, as well as under various national laws, or even under human rights treaties, there is the, the right to health is recognized. And here in Qatar, 
the Constitution mandates that the state take action to protect the health of individuals. And so I, I think one of the more short-term and long-term implications is to what extent are we going to move beyond this, this rights approach that has an emphasis on, on the in, individual. If I could just quickly touch on the multidisciplinary uh, yeah. approach, and I think that it's incumbent upon law schools to reach out to our faculty in engineering, in medicine, and, and uh, computer sciences and the like. Uh, many of those faculty don't want to hear from lawyers. They're, they want to conduct their research freely, and, and it's only after they create the technology, the tracing technology, or it's only after uh, they have started to get some important data about each individual that they say, oops, what can we do with what can we do with this? And so having outreach early and coordinating some of their work, getting legal perspectives on the table, I think is, is uh, uh, very important. And just, I can just give you an example. I think what's been going on with online medicine, uh, people can't go to the doctor, so now the doctors are online. Well, what are the legal implications of that? And so my colleague uh, here at HBKU is working with Wild Cornell Medical School, which is just across campus, and they had a conference or a workshop dealing with the legal implications of getting, getting your uh, diagnosis via, via this, this medium. Right. So, Professor Burton? Uh, thank you very much uh, for your very kind invitation to this utterly significant uh, uh, event. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, crisis has a huge impact, not only on the legal architecture of different jurisdictions, but also on the legal assumptions, uh, prepositions, uh, frameworks that have been developed uh, in years. And from emergency regimes, to the socioeconomic crisis uh, that uh, Susan uh, has recently mentioned, we have witnessed both uh, the responsiveness and the incompetency of the current constitutional or uh, statutory structures. And in the field of uh, private law, there are various uh, challenges as regards to application of force majeure clauses or the clauses uh, to be applied to temporary non-performance of contractual obligations. Uh, in general, the COVID-19 has had a disruptive impact on the constitutional uh, premises and the legal settings that inequalities, injustices, and particularly the vulnerable groups come to the forefront. The parliamentary oversight has been impaired in most of the uh, jurisdictions that we face the reality of the augmentation of the executive power uh, due to the uh, rapid uh, responsiveness in uh, crisis management. Uh, another uh, phenomenon uh, is the expert committees. Uh, the expert committees uh, composed of uh, health professionals have played a very significant role in the decision-making process in most of the jurisdictions, but the lack of transparency and the rise of technocracy uh, both have uh, replaced the democratic oversight and legitimacy. And the COVID-19 has led to a con convergence, uh, in fact, between entrenched democracies and the electoral democracies uh, and electoral autocracies as well. Uh, in this respect, uh, particularly uh, the crisis management in form of declaration of uh, emergency or using different uh, uh, tools of uh, soft law, uh, it's quite uh, uh, remarkable. Uh, uh, however, uh, we uh, truly observe uh, that uh, the principle of legality, uh, the erosion of civil liberties, uh, and uh, in some of the jurisdiction, uh, the erosion of socioeconomic rights, and so in some of the jurisdiction, the endorsement of the right to health, as well as the right, uh, the, the welfare state, uh, have been similarly uh, challenged. And under the pressure of current economic regression, disruption of the rule of law and the inequalities, including poverty issues, domestic violence, scarcity of public resources, there is an urgent need uh, for a revival of critical theories of law. However, from a new perspective that COVID-19 uh, has uh, underlined. And here, the class, uh, gender, race, equal distribution of economic wealth, nature, the climate change, uh, strong democratic, as well as international institutions, 
should be at the center of legal uh, research. And such a critical study as although should also go hand in hand with a global approach uh, to the legal teaching and research, both in the field of uh, theory and applied disciplines of law. I generally think that the policy-oriented legal uh, research may play a more significant role uh, in the aftermath of the uh, pandemic. Uh, and in this respect, not only the multidisciplinarity, but also interdisciplinarity should play a crucial role. Right. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Bertel. And taking a cue from, from what you said, it also kind of uh, you know, raises a very important question, especially uh, the pandemic struck at a time, obviously, when there are a lot of uh, doctoral students, young research scholars who are kind of embedded in our law schools or who are kind of pursuing different kind of research. And of course, you have master's students pursuing their dissertation. Uh, how do we really, uh, within the law school framework, kind of encourage students to kind of pursue research? What impact has the, the, the COVID had in terms of how students have kind of, uh, you know, re-emphasized and refocused their research? How do we even ensure uh, one of the biggest uh, problems, especially students who are doing or pursuing uh, empirical research is, is the fact that the, the COVID pretty much kind of put a halt to any kind of field-based research. So how, how, how do we as law schools kind of encourage students to kind of pursue research? And how would, you, how would we accommodate certain kind of research, uh, you know, endeavors of students? Uh, Professor Tan? Well, thank you. And I have to say that, you know, this is um, uh, a challenging question uh, to answer. Um, I would maybe start by saying that I, I feel very sorry for many of uh, the students who are pursuing their doctoral studies uh, today, because many of them no doubt are looking for academic appointments. And I think that academic appointments in the next few years are going to be very challenging to get, because there's been a general cutback in funding for higher education, um, not only because of, you know, because not only because the public finances of many countries are going to be stretched, but also because um, it's been more difficult to admit foreign students. And many, many uh, law schools depend a great deal on foreign students as part of their revenue. So I think that's going to be a real challenge. So if you're a PhD student, how can you, in a sense, try to differentiate yourself? I mean, I think that's fundamentally, you know, the question that you're, you've posed. Um, I, I would say this, um, the pandemic has really opened up important avenues and I think created a sort of laboratory within which we may well have a once in a lifetime opportunity to observe and comment on. I mean, a number of my colleagues have already said, for instance, that there are challenges on the, on, on, on the, on the, on the part of you know, co constitutional lawyers, there are civil liberties issues, uh, and so on and so forth. There are questions to which um, you have to weigh public interest against private um, rights. And I think it pays, it will bear, I think, uh, dividends if one were to sort of consider these issues using the COVID-19 pandemic as an experiment, just to try to draw out, and here I, I need to stress this, just to draw out general conclusions and, 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 and normative answers that could well apply beyond the COVID-19 situation. Because the last thing that you want to do is focus very narrowly on COVID-19 research, such that the work that you've done becomes not terribly relevant once we ride out this crisis, right? So you need to look for normative answers. You need to look for lessons that are of greater interest, broader interest to humanity, to legal systems, to the whole idea of the debate between rights and between the common good. I think if you can focus on drawing out the broader lessons that we can learn from the COVID-19 situation, you will perhaps uh, be in a very good position because you will have made the most of a very difficult situation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Kagesh? Uh, <clears throat> Vishwas, thank you for that question. I'm personally very grateful because I believe I'm the only one on the panel 
who can answer that question from the student's perspective because i am a doctoral student right now so for the record uh, i am i am i'm enrolled uh, in an sjd program at uh, morrer school of law indiana university bloomington under the guidance of professor joseph hoffman who's my uh, who's my thesis advisor and a wonderful wonderful guy now i'll i'm going to answer this uh, which was completely from the perspective of a doctoral student now surprisingly before i left last year in december my arrangement with my, with my thesis advisor was that um, uh, i'll go back to india and uh, mo- my entire work is doctrinal all i need is access to a decent library a lot of literature review but but most of what we do as you probably know goes on in the head we don't have to go and collect any data so on that side note i think doctrinal work can continue but my arrangement with my advisor was that uh, uh, i would make a google doc and i will send in the link and we'll do a whatsapp call and we'll manage this way i did not know zoom existed it did i had no idea zoom existed and a facetime call was far far too t- t- problematic with i don't they, i did not know screen share existed now as a result of all this i was able to do what i had actually had to do much more efficiently by planning a, a zoom call and sharing my screen and then he gives me his comments and so on and so forth so i think i think that way it's it's much easier for my thesis advisor who's sitting in a completely different time zone to guide me and for me to be able to take time with him and the um, this is the same experience that i have had with the students who have worked with me so i think see one thing that i saw that in the beginning of the session uh, a speaker said and then throughout the sessions le- yesterday also many people said the same thing i think all those on this panel will agree with me that what will going the new normal that's going to come out of this it's not going to be the old normal that we are used to that's not going to happen some version of so some sort of hybrid is going to come out and my experience in that of other i've spoken with my friends who are practicing law in delhi and bombay and bangalore i've spoken with my professors abroad and some of my lawyer friends and everybody seems to be of the view that um a hybrid is going to come out so for example in supreme court online hearings highly likely will be continued but whether they will be for the miscellaneous days monday and friday or for or, or for actual regular hearings that's that seems to be something that in new course people will have to decide and i think the same is going to be true of academics so i i i think that's that's the what um so uh, one thing that was uh, said was by my, my uh, the speaker before uh, he talked about academic appointments and i think i think the the manner in which academic appointments have been done in law schools at least in law schools that tend to have a common law shared heritage for example india or that in singapore or that in the west i think the criteria on the basis of which appointments are made in law schools at least in these shared jurisdictions will have to be completely rethought whenever the new normal is which i hope hope will be so, soon i think the ability to deliver online is going to uh, be a key factor and uh, uh, i think the, uh, the the people who are good with these technologies Uh, they are going to play crucial roles as 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 we go along we sh- they 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 should anyway because i think uh, some sort of hybrid is going to remain and in that hybrid meeting with students conducting office hours conducting tutorials uh, dealing with uh, 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 seminar courses which earlier would have to be scrapped for the availability of so 10 people have to enroll only 6 did i think a lot of challenges can be now done away with but along with that i think people using this technology will have to evolve what they will that would look like is for us all to see but i think that is an inevitability that can't be denied in professor susan uh, thank you uh, let me get back to just sort of the premise of of the question and and that is is that are we going to ask or encourage our students to do a wholesale shift and and i th- i think uh dean cheng hen hen pen uh picked up on this i think what we need to do is to look at what has happened and ask our students to look at the assumptions that they have made um like if somebody is is working uh on on a on a dissertation uh or a master's thesis that is doesn't make reference to perhaps duties individuals now owe to society 
the duty to, to, to wear a mask, the duty not to go out of the house, and if they're dealing with individual liberties, that would be something that would be missing, I think, if, 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 if we have a student who's working on a major constitutional paper and, and the like. Um, I, I am very cautious first in advising students to, to, to take a topic that they want to work on that will be socially uh, significant. I think it is absolutely incumbent upon us as, as faculty to alert students to issues that could be relevant. And clearly out of the, this pandemic has come a whole host of, of, of relevant issues. Let me just um, pick up on a second point. Um, students do need access to sources. A lot of our students uh, uh, work with uh, library sources. And the good news is that uh, uh, we have access to substantial databases and the like. I find it a bit challenging, uh, unless the students have been completely trained in using them to get the, getting them up to speed, even through this, this medium. Uh, but I think that one of the important developments is uh, the extent to which sources are now uh, more readily available, open, open sources. Um, I think this is going to have a profound change on research. Have we now got past a lot of firewalls um, because otherwise uh, when a large portion of the world is dependent on, on uh, getting information online, uh, yet they can't afford the, you know, the substantial cost of, of, of this information. Um, I know that a number of publishers are offering a lot of that information and it's incumbent upon us again as, as, as faculty to help steer the students uh, 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 to those uh, source, sources. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Professor Burton. Uh, many thanks again. Uh, in terms of uh, library sources, uh, we had to enhance uh, our databases uh, considering the needs of uh, our PhD students, our uh, master's law students. Uh, in general, uh, we had a threefold strategy which is based on uh, the meetings, uh, establishing uh, certain milestones and providing support, uh, particularly to the uh, PhD students. We have organized, uh, and we, are, we still organize, uh, uh, regular individual meetings, uh, ideally uh, monthly. Uh, however, we also organize uh, weekly or bi-weekly uh, meetings uh, with the students to talk beyond research uh, as how they are doing. And we also run regular uh, research uh, uh, group meetings and we have uh, tried to establish uh, a network uh, that uh, the PhD students uh, may share uh, their progress uh, reports with their own community so that they can receive the feedback uh, from uh, their peers. Uh, we organize uh, different types of uh, meetings, not only for our own PhD students, however, we organize uh, graduate workshops, uh, gathering uh, the PhD uh, students uh, globally or uh, at the domestic uh, level. Uh, we have tried to set uh, realistic and achievable uh, milestones, uh, and these may need to be uh, revisited uh, as COVID-19 situations uh, shift. Uh, and we try to celebrate, in fact, even the smallest of the uh, success. We try to provide an uh, empathetic ear and to be aware uh, of the fact that we cannot solve all the problems. However, we are aware of the uh, counseling services uh, that the, our university offers. And we try to openly discuss uh, uh, the support uh, issue because uh, the mental health issue can be also uh, a problem besides uh, some of the financial uh, issues that we encourage the students to take the advantage of support of the university's offering. And we also try to be sure uh, to look after uh, uh, our own well-being too, because this is also uh, crucial. Uh, I also uh, hold the UNESCO Chair on Gender Equality and Sustainable Development, and we have organized uh, the chair as a research hub, uh, having a very strong multidisciplinary uh, perspective that we uh, organize different types of uh, events for sharing our experiences in the field of research. And in the meantime, we have uh, developed a very strong focus on research methodology because uh, it seems uh, crucial when we take into account the shifts uh, 
uh, towards uh, the policy-oriented research, evidence-based research, empirical uh, legal uh, research, and uh, it, and it was uh, uh, just uh, an advantage for the PhD uh, students because uh, now they have the opportunity to re rethink about their own research uh, methodology uh, in line with the recent uh, developments. Thank you, Professor Bertel. Uh, a very closely connected uh, aspect related to research is, of course, uh, the, 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 the resources required to actually run research centers and certain kind of research, which is largely financial uh, aid, either in the form of uh, research grants or, 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 or big funding coming through uh, big organizations. Do you think, uh, um, to all the panelists, do you think uh, as, as, as uh, this pretty much kind of, as COVID kind of uh, uh, created a shift in priorities as far funding in legal research is concerned, do you think there would be a forced reallocation of uh, research funding and grants towards uh, research that is catering to COVID-19? Are the expense of research areas funded uh, prior to the pandemic? And do you envisage post-pandemic, is there going to be a recalibration in terms of funders and, and those who kind of uh, allocate grants? Are they going to kind of, uh, you know, rethink their strategy for funding legal research? Uh, Professor Chan? Yes. Um, I think that actually the the major problem for law schools is you know, the extent to which um, a lot of the, well, let, let me put it in a different way. I would say that funding agencies and funding institutions are always looking for research that has an impact, right? That's novel and that can make a big impact because obviously they want their money to have the biggest possible bang for its buck. And there's always no doubt that year on year or over every three-year cycle, there are bound to be certain issues that are more topical than others and where the attention of the funding agencies will be more directed at. So the pandemic may be an obvious situation of this, but I think it is something that law schools around the world have always had to navigate, right? It's nothing new in itself. Um, and therefore, to that extent, I don't really see a major shift because as far as law schools are concerned, it is incumbent for us to, if you like, fight our corner, right? We need to, as we have in the past and we have historically, we always have to go to funding agencies, very often dominated by scientists and engineers, and tell them why legal research of this nature is impactful and novel. And I think this is a wider problem that generally people in the humanities and social sciences face. So I think this is in many ways an old problem. And I think we just need to continue to be smarter about it. And sometimes linking the research that we do to the topics of the day is one way forward to try to bring in more research money and yet at the same time do fundamental research that is useful to the law as well. Right. Thank you for the question. Thanks, thanks, uh, Professor Chang. Uh, Professor Kogesh? Thank you, Vishwas. Uh, I think the question has two elements. One is the source of the funding. Second, the application of it. Uh, I think uh, so far as the application of the money is concerned, I mean, to what ends the money will be used. I think that authority ultimately rests in the person who actually has the final decision to spend that money. To that extent, if the government decides to, uh, uh, I mean, any state, not, not just the government of India, any given state, decides to uh, uh, use the public money to fund uh, COVID related research in sciences as well as the law or other humanities. I think that's a decision ultimately that the elected representatives of the people make. And ultimately it's, it's the pub public purse. So there will be no dispute with that proposition. But I think uh, as, as, the, as, as we move more towards solution and management of the issue, I think eventually there will come a, a point of time when, when those concerns will ch change and let, I think public concerns should be let, left with the public. But I think so far as the spending of that money institutionally is concerned, private institutions such as ours and across the, glo uh, across the globe, um, um, I think it'll, it'll be quite, I, COVID, related research, see, if somebody comes and says that there are many ways to link 
any research project with anything if 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 you have enough command on the on the english language and you play played a little so i think at that point of time the role of the senior people in the in the academic profession becomes very important and i think people who know that this is actually useful research and this is just a you know way to get across try to convince people to spend money on what they shouldn't be spend i think that's where people who are much higher than at least me in the in in this field i think one should rely on their the guidance and one's own gut feeling and ultimately i think uh, as far as the source of the money is concerned public spending notwithstanding i think philanthropy is going to be the way forward i think uh, raj might want to say a word on that and the end but i think the money coming from industrial houses and so on and so forth but with no riders attached though that's an ideal ideal world but i think that's that's the objective when you were to achieve a world as close as possible to the ideal one right right uh, professor sulu yes i think that we need to look at the question from the context of the consequences of the pandemic and in my mind there is no doubt that one of the biggest ramifications is the fact that we now have society that is communicating through this medium conducting business through this medium um and so when we consider the pandemic i'm looking at the consequences and roughly by way of digitalization and that concept has resonated at least with some funders here uh we recently uh submitted and got a grant for work in the area of digitalization of trade finance um and thinking about ways in which our communities and 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 a number of the speakers have already alluded to this uh are going to be completely different whether it be law related such as courts okay in 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 the way courts will be doing their business and the like or whether it be as i mentioned earlier with uh medicine but further i think we are going to see some profound changes in the regulatory regime think of the ways in which uh a vaccine is coming uh to approval on on sort of a fast track basis what changes have been made what assumptions did we make about the way things needed to be done are we are we changing anything uh and what what perhaps would enable us to to have a better regime that is more cost effective and and the like and so the pandemic has caused us to 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 question uh a lot of things it it opens up so many new horizons so we're not uh submitting proposals covid-19 and whatever whatever instead it's looking at the consequences of this and and in that respect i don't think we'll ever uh go away from from uh the profound effect that digitalization is going to have and and also in the area of data privacy too so right. so that's a little Uh, the funding opportunities uh, always shape uh, the research uh, and uh, this is equally valid uh, for the legal studies uh, in may 2020 the european university association has published an official uh, briefing and uh, and in this uh, official briefing uh, the association noted uh, that the pandemic is likely to affect income resources for universities across europe and that this impact may have a far reaching uh, ramifications uh, and according to the uh, european university association again uh, as the countries digest the economic uh, consequences of coronavirus crisis there is a significant uh, risk that public funding allocations across uh, europe will decrease in the next 2 uh, to 4 years uh, then considering particularly the competition uh, for public resources uh, across various sectors of the uh, economy and that is the reason there are good reasons we should worry about uh, research contracts uh, philanthropic uh, sources and other types of university income will be also uh, affected uh, and uh, the probable post pandemic economic recession uh will play a key role in this respect uh, and uh, the competition particularly for the e e european union grants may increase uh, to an unsustainable uh, 
point. However, uh, both for, for the Europe, particularly for the Horizon 2020 program and the new uh, Horizon Europe uh, program, uh, there are also different types of uh, opportunities that may enhance particularly multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinary uh, research. Of course, uh, there is a shift in priorities, but this also opens a new avenue for developing new research ideas and opening uh, a space. In the field of human rights, uh, the neglected areas such as gender equality, domestic violence, poverty, the democratic institutions may, uh, may again uh, gain importance, not at the expense of nanotechnology or similar science and engineering uh, disciplines, but for the benefit of social sciences, including the uh, law. In case of Turkey and uh, in case of uh, many uh, other countries, we have also uh, witnessed uh, rapid response funds uh, for, for research uh, related to the COVID-19. And this has been also a very good uh, opportunity for making the right assessment. We have to uh, wait and uh, see the announcements uh, as regards funding. However, we should be rather uh, cautious and uh, careful to follow the developments uh, in terms of uh, income. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bertul, on that. Um, I want a quick response from all the panelists, uh, more specifically with, uh, with respect to uh, the area of publication. And, and, and we know that with the advent of COVID, a lot of, uh, you know, in-house, you know, law review journals, publishers have uh, emphasized a lot on COVID-related uh, topics to be published. Uh, uh, is there a serious problem in terms of trying to kind of, uh, it's almost like, you know, first to get to publish and law, law reviews want to kind of publish on areas and topics related to COVID. Is there a problem related to that kind of an approach? How can we address uh, concerns where, uh, you know, we, we ensure that there is quality in terms of publication as well, because everyone wants to hurry and rush and, and get publication, something related to COVID. And we've seen in, in science-based journals, there have been a number of instances where there's a backlash and uh, there have also been withdrawal of, of articles. So how do we ensure quality and how do we, how do law, law reviews kind of tend to respond to, to situations like this? Uh, Professor uh, Tan? Uh, I, I think uh, you, you need to unmute. Un yeah. So thanks very much for that question. And I think we can kind of look at it from three perspectives. I think first we have what, you know, we have a lot of uh, online platforms now where you can, in a sense, self-publish, SSRN probably being the most well-known. Um, I think I'm not particularly worried about those platforms because um, many of us understand that, you know, this is not peer-reviewed work. It might even be exploratory drafts uh, in, in progress. And I think people tend to look at them and in a sense, uh, take them for what they are and sort of look at them very carefully as well. Um, then you have perhaps um, an, out, an output of, um, of books that try to capture um, COVID-19 and all its legal and, and, and social economic uh, implications. And I think, um, you know, uh, in this field, I think a lot really depends on who the publisher is, um, who the editors are as well. And I think that's certainly one indicator. But I think, again, you know, for anybody who's a serious researcher, you can't just take it at face value, right? You've got to exercise good judgment in terms of, you know, what is credible and what perhaps might be a little more questionable. As far as journal articles are concerned, I think that with respect to the very best journals, well, obviously, certain things can get through from time to time. Again, I think the quality is generally quite high because there's really rigorous peer review. I mean, I just submitted a couple of pieces this year and my goodness, the peer reviews are very rigorous, you know, and I think that's, that makes the final product uh, even better. Um, so I think I'm less worried about that. Now, to your question of whether there's such an emphasis on COVID-19 type work that, you, that other scholars who are not quite so interested in this area or don't work so much in the kinds of intersections with this area might suffer. I personally have not found that to be the case because I think at the end of the day, with the very best journals, with very good journals, they're ultimately looking for quality pieces. 
right? And quality pieces really are pieces that have a certain novelty to them that really push the avenues of our, our thinking that in a sense advances the field of knowledge. And frankly, in whatever field, as long as you meet that criteria, any good journal will be interested in getting the piece. It may be you have to queue up longer. We all know the queues are getting longer and longer, but you will get an admission ticket at the end of the day. Thank you. Professor Gagesh? Thank you, Vishwas. I think I agree with the Professor Tan to a certain extent. <clears throat> I think it's undeniable. Uh, it's a force of nature that a lot of publications will now have a more uh, uh, COVID-central uh, theme or, or a COVID-central focus. I think that's, that's something that nobody can dispute. It's, it's bound to happen. And it's been seen to happen from time to time. So nothing special there. I think uh, if I understood Professor Tan to be correct, which is also my own impression, the standards of peer review and the internal standards by which quality is maintained, uh, the, the existence whereof I think is paramount to having any good journal as you from your own experience are very well aware of. Now, those have not been affected by COVID. As I said, attention has been shifted, but the core concerns they have to remain the same. And if they don't remain the same, I think our institutions have enough, enough, uh, enough history and, and, and practice of precedent to make course correction. So I think some, you will, uh, I think it's, it's possible in some journals, suddenly a lot of COVID connected publications come, but ultimately uh, uh, I think that course will correct itself. Secondly, I also have uh, published couple of pieces recently, none of them even used the word COVID except for a short newspaper article. So I, I also personally have not really experienced this shift in, 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 the, in the standards, which ultimately decide the worthiness of the product that you have created. So I think to that extent, I agree. Right. Professor Susan? Yes, I think that we've seen in, the, in, in blogs, sort of the focus on the topic of the day, and this is the topic of eight or nine months now. Um, and that's a, a convenient way to at least ha have a conversation and not have the quite the standard of the, the peer reviewed publication and the like. But in, in anticipation of, of, of today's session, I talked to some of my colleagues about this very subject. And there, there are these uh, journals that may have an issue dedicated to COVID and and the like. Okay, and, and uh, but but in terms of, of the a wholesale shift. I um, I agree with the other the other speakers. That said, I a colleague did did mention that uh, he's been doing a lot of work in the area of the blockchain, and uh, we actually had uh, getting back to sort of the research areas, looking at blockchain and smart contracts and dispute resolution. That's one thing. Again, getting back to the digitization. But he he uh, recently got an article accepted. Uh, blockchain and clinical trials. And mind you, it, it has, it's not COVID specific, but there may be a greater interest in the subject in light of what we're going through. So again, it's looking at the full ramifications of, of the pandemic and what does this mean for various aspects of society and the extent to which faculty members, uh, students can contribute and perhaps the legal capacity in certain areas, I think, is the absolute uh, 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 critical focus, and uh, um, the quality issue. I, I would uh, agree with the other the other speakers. That's uh, you know, we law reviews don't crank out publications in two 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 months. It takes a long time to go through the various peer reviews to to finally get your article um, um, out there. Yeah, thank you, Professor Susan, Professor Bertel. I totally agree with my uh, colleagues. Uh, some of the journals have issues, of course, special issues on the pandemic. Some of them have not prioritized the pandemic at all. Uh, however, uh, we need research on the social and economic impacts of this uh, crisis to assist policymakers to understand the impact of current legal interventions. Uh, because uh, we should be very cautious uh, and we should uh, uh, prepare ourselves for extraordinary times, not only as regards uh, of this uh, serious pandemic, uh, however, as regards natural disasters, including uh, the ramifications arising uh, from climate uh, change. Uh, 
we need this to plan future policy to mitigate uh, unintended consequences of uh, such extraordinary responses. We need uh, to map and understand the legal challenges as to the social disruptions, including, including uh, closing down parts of the economy, uh, increasing unemployment, forcing some people into social isolation, restricting uh, the freedom of movement, closing schools, universities, uh, reducing democratic decision-making of governments and uh, generally disrupting uh, the social uh, order of the pre-COVID-19 world. Although some journals have not opted for a special issue, uh, there are ri rising topics related uh, to the pandemic, such as right to health, risk society, uh, significantly digitalization and the role of experts and their epistemologic uh, authority in a democracy, uh, neoliberal constructs uh, or biotechnology uh, and the law. Uh, another serious uh, issue is the open access. Uh, in case of uh, the EU uh, funding, open access plays a very significant uh, role. Uh, and uh, the European Code of Conduct on Research Integrity states that uh, researchers, uh, research institutions and organizations uh, should ensure access to the data. And the data should be as open as possible, as close as necessary, uh, and uh, very appropriate in line uh, with the uh, principles, uh, uh, the, the so-called principles, the FAIR principles for data management. Uh, these are findable, accessible, and interoperable, uh, and uh, the reusable. And all partners in research collaborations agree uh, at the outset uh, on the goals of the research, uh, and of course, on the pro process of communicating their research uh, as transparently and openly as uh, uh, possible. However, the open access uh, should not remove the responsibilities uh, arising from research quality and research integrity. That is the reason we need a clear framework uh, to remind uh, and impose the rules of uh, research integrity uh, to protect the quality uh, of the uh, publications. Uh, there are uh, various conferences and symposia discussing this very significant uh, uh, issue. However, uh, this issue has not been tackled uh, right now because of the predatory journals uh, in the field of uh, open access. And there are various other uh, issues of research uh, integrity related to the open access. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Professor Bertel, and I thank all the panelists for, for such rich views and perspectives on, on, on these various questions, uh, uh, various aspects that I've, 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 that we've dealt with. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I, I hope uh, uh, we have just about enough time for a question. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a set of questions asked by the audience. I'm going to read out one of the interesting questions that, uh, you know, we can, at least we have the time to kind of take at least one question. Uh, what are the new initiatives taken and what are the various research tools used by universities across the globe to ensure that the fundamentals of research are not compromised? Uh, you know, obviously kind of the pandemic throws a whole range of challenges. And how, how do universities deal with uh, an issue like this, especially with lockout, with virtual kind of functioning, uh, when people pursue research, how do we ensure that the fundamental blocks of research are not compromised? So uh, any of the panelists? I'll be very succinct. It boils down to one word really, which is culture, right? And that sort of culture is built up over time with proper leadership, with uh, deans and associate deans who have a genuine sense and understanding of what it means to be a scholarly institution. I think we have that and we can preserve this. We might run into crises from now and from time to time, but you know, the fundamental mission of the university and what everybody appreciates to be our role will not change. Right. right. If I could chime in on that, and it, and it needs to be um, understood, the culture, but also to the extent it could be put in writing is reflected in a policy. And also for the, supervi the faculty supervisors to instill that in um, everything they do with each of their, the students, the, you know, that it, it's building it from the ground up so that, uh, and, and I think uh, Bert will address some of these concepts in just the last few seconds of, of her, her remarks about the standards within the European Union too. Professor Bertel, 
Uh, yeah, uh, I totally agree uh, uh, with the explanation as regards the culture and the policy and not only the universities, but also the national research uh, institutions, as well as uh, the academies of sciences and humanities uh, should play a crucial uh, role uh, to keep uh, the value of the fundamental uh, research under current uh, circumstances. And there are uh, ongoing studies uh, to emphasize uh, the significance of uh, this fundamental uh, research. And uh, there are also different uh, types of schemes uh, and uh, programs developed by the national research uh, institutions and also uh, by the international actors such as the uh, EU. And there are also different types of developments under European Research Council uh, projects uh, to, uh, to support uh, the fundamental uh, research, however, to keep up uh, with the developments uh, or, or the stress created by COVID-19 pandemic. Okay. Uh, Kogesh, do you have, uh, Professor Kogesh, you have, you're, you're on mute. Sorry, may I just ask you to briefly repeat the question? It's, it's fundamental. What's the word used after that? So the, so the point is, uh, the, the COVID has challenged the way we tend to pursue research. And yeah. uh, how can universities kind of uh, ensure that the fundamental core aspects of research be preserved and, and, and ensure quality? Yes. Fundamental or core aspects. I have a slightly spiritual approach towards it, which is, I mean, uh, uh, I think the fundamental or the core aspect of research is primary mental. It has to do with habits of mind. And after that, and only after that, anything else is irrelevant. In my particular case, I've tried to do this with the 120 odd students that were uh, under my charge this semester with who, to whom I taught evidence is by first of all, telling them you have to calm your mind and you have to be in the right frame of mind to be able to do any research of worth any value. I think this is the way, and this is the guidance that I have received since I joined the bar. This is the guidance that I've received from the family watching my father practice law and others. I think the fundamental way in which universities can do this is by helping students obtain states of mind that allow them some calmness for which meditative practices may be used, but ultimately it's to eat, to, to, I mean, each his own meditation and prayer are two different concepts symbolizing the same thing. This is the approach that I take. I look at a statute and read it as if it was scripture. Just doing that gives me a peace of mind that I hope by suggestion others are able to obtain. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, Kagesh. And thanks. I, I once again take the opportunity to thank all the panelists. Uh, Raj, over to you. We are, we are not going to, you know, uh, run into the, the, the 15 minute, uh, you know, time that we have. Thank you so much, uh, Vishwas. And of course, thank you, Chengan and Susan and Susan and Bertil and Kagesh. What a fascinating panel because so many issues that you touched in the course of this discussion uh, is uh, as we speak, uh, debated and discussed in faculty board meetings, as well as uh, institutional policies, regulatory bodies are also talking about it, to what extent legal research needs to be reimagined. So I am grateful to you for your time. It's an absolute pleasure to see all of you. I look forward to seeing all of you on our campus sooner than later. Uh, be safe and take care. Uh, we will have a short uh, 12 to 13 minute recess, and then we'll be back uh, in um, at 3.45 p.m. Indian Standard Time uh, for the Constitution Day Forum. India is celebrating its Constitution Day today. Uh, in, um, uh, uh, on 26 November 1949, we adopted our Constitution. We have a plenary panel on the theme, Women, Law, and the Legal Profession. Honorable Ms. Justice Geeta Mittal, Chief Justice of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court is delivering a keynote address. We have uh, the presidential address by Ms. Uh, Geeta Ramasation, advocate of the Madras High Court, and another colleague of mine, Professor um, uh, uh, Juma Sen will also be delivering a special address. So I look forward to seeing you back there. Thank you very much.